It was a strange place for two teenage boys to be, lying on the train tracks in the middle of the woods near Bryan, Arkansas. By the time the three men in the lead engine of the northbound Union Pacific saw the boys, it was already too late. Risking derailment, the engineer threw the mile-long train into emergency and laid down on its horn. Despite the vibration of the tracks, the screeching of metal against metal and the deafening blast of the horn, the boys didn't move. The train's powerful headlight allowed the engineer, conductor, and brakeman to see that the boys were lying side by side across the tracks in identical positions, their bodies partially covered with a tarp. Moments later, the train overtook the motionless boys. The victims were Don Henry, 16, and Kevin Ives, 17, both of Saline County, Arkansas. They would have started their senior year at Bryant High School the next day. Kevin had spent the night at Don's house, and the two had ventured outside a little after midnight never to return. Little did anyone know at the time that these two friends had unwittingly stumbled upon an underworld of drug smuggling and government corruption. A cover-up of unbelievable proportions was about to begin. Kevin and Don were near the tracks that night and saw either money or drugs dropped from an airplane. Uh, I believe that law enforcement officers killed them and uh, the cover-up began immediately, um, expanded to the medical examiner, Fami Malik. At the time, Fami Malik, Arkansas State Medical Examiner, was the one responsible for ruling on cause of death. His plan was to rule the boy's death a double suicide. However, after conferring with Jim Steed, Saline County Sheriff, they decided no one would accept such a ruling and change the cause of death to accidental. We were absolutely puzzled and outraged over the ruling uh, of accidental as a manner of death. Uh, we didn't think that the facts supported that ruling. Uh, and what we started out to do was just to obtain a second opinion. Uh, we met resistance from all fronts, from law enforcement, from the crime lab. Uh, we retained an attorney and a private investigator and obtained court orders to get um, testable samples of everything that they had in order to get a second opinion. And Femi Malik refused to obey the court orders. Without any supporting evidence, Malik ruled that the boys had each smoked more than 20 marijuana cigarettes and in a psychedelic stupor had fallen asleep on the tracks. It was later learned that the state crime lab never even tested for the concentration of marijuana and in fact had used a test on the boy's blood which was designed to be used on urine. Outside experts were shocked at the absurd ruling. The family's nightmare battle against the state medical examiner was made more difficult by Governor Clinton's public support of Malik. However, after 13 long months, the parents were finally able to prove what they had believed all along that the boys had indeed been murdered. 17-year-old Kevin Ives and 16-year-old Don Henry were struck by a train near Alexander. The medical examiner has said that the boys were asleep and drugged with marijuana. The parents, however, disputed that claim and persuaded authorities to reopen the case. Because of their persistence, Kevin and Don's bodies were exhumed. New autopsies were performed and a grand jury was convened. Dr. Joseph Burton, a nationally recognized forensic pathologist from out of state performed the new autopsies. His findings revealed that Don Henry had been stabbed in the back and Kevin Ives' face had been smashed by a blow from a rifle butt before their bodies were placed on the railroad tracks. This information alone would strongly suggest that the boys were injured, uh, rendered unconscious or even killed prior to their bodies being run over by the train. Burton's autopsies also revealed that Malik had mutilated Kevin's skull by sawing it in so many different directions that it was impossible to tell where the original skull fractures were. Malik also had completely dismantled Kevin's jawbones. Burton stated he had performed thousands of autopsies and had never seen anything like it. Was Malik trying to hide something? Was there a step that 
The answer is no, they were not stabbed. Were they dead beforehand? Absolutely no, they were alive. A former employee at the crime lab has said he discovered what appeared to be evidence of a stab wound during the original autopsy, but was told, quote, not to worry about it. Malik has refused all comment. The deaths of these two boys uh, most probably were not accidental deaths, but that they met their death as a result of injuries inflicted on them by other uh, people or another person. In addition to Burton, two other forensic pathologists and seven forensic investigators with more than 100 years accumulated experience investigating homicides reviewed the case. It was their collective opinion that the ruling be changed to murder. During the midst of all of um, the turmoil uh, with trying to get the ruling changed in our case, it became very apparent that uh, this was not an isolated instance of an error in the ruling on the manner of death. Uh, there were many other cases statewide that um, we became aware of. In 1992, the Los Angeles Times tallied more than 20 additional cases where Dr. Malik had falsified evidence and ruled incorrectly. One case involved the murder of Raymond Albright, who had been shot five times in the chest with a Colt 45. Incredibly, Malik had ruled suicide. Another involved James Dewey Milam, whose body was found without the head. In this case, Malik ruled the cause of death to be an ulcer. Although Milam's head had been clearly severed with a knife, Malik claimed the family pooch had bitten off the head, eaten the entire thing and then regurgitated. Malik says he tested the dog's vomit and found traces of Milam's brain and skull. Unfortunately for Dr. Malik, Milam's head was later found. Malik, it turns out, had made up the entire story. Media coverage of Malik's dishonest rulings resulted in a massive public outcry calling for his removal from office. The medical examiner comes up and he has fabrication to where he has, has, has created his own evidence. This is of a magnitude that could create a national scandal, and if necessary, it will. I have work to do. Dr. Malik, you me. I have work to do. Excuse yes. me, please. And what you, you, and you uh, can say that you, you like are honest. Dr. Malik. Lying on his autopsy cases, lying in court, yeah. and he's not an honest person. And why should he be prosecuted? He should be prosecuted. Nevertheless, both Governor Clinton and the Arkansas State Medical Examiner Commission Chairman, Jocelyn Elders, who had the power to remove Malik from office, not only insisted he remain, they gave him a raise. Based on the facts I have, I really feel that Arkansas owes Dr. Malik a great debt and a real apology. Today, the governor was asked if Malik should resign. I don't think that's a decision that I should make based on what I now know. It didn't matter what Malik did, whether it was uh, perjure himself in court, fabricate evidence in murder trials, call coroners murderers. Uh, Clinton defended him by uh, excusing it as being stressed out, uh, overworked, and underpaid. Uh, his testimony compromised evidence in a lot of felony cases in Arkansas. And uh, it was very transparent that um, Fammy Malik had some kind of hold over Bill Clinton. Uh, the end result was that he was given a $14,000 raise. It was an absolute insult to my family. Read my lips. I'm not going to comment. I was outraged that protecting a political crony of Clinton's was more important than the fact that two young boys had been murdered. Despite the policy of investigating any suspicious death as a homicide until proven otherwise, the Saline County deputy who took control of the scene where Kevin and Don were murdered immediately ordered it worked as an accident. Procedures were never taken to protect the scene and properly collect evidence. If we were told to work as an accident, you know, or the investigators were told to work as an accident, and it was uh, not enough time and emphasis put into it right there at the scene. Against all standard police procedures, the back of the train was used as a reference point to record the location of the boys' bodies and possessions. Once the train left, the reference point was lost forever, and the information gathered became totally useless. Our local investigation was headed by our sheriff, Jim Steed. He later went on television bragging about 
what a thorough investigation he had conducted and that uh, he felt very sorry for us as parents, but that he had every confidence in Femi Malik's ruling. Their investigation was so thorough that they left my son's foot out there for two days in plain sight. A number of pieces of evidence collected at the scene eventually turned up missing. Police refused to acknowledge the existence of this gun even though its collection by police was captured on video. Likewise, all three members of the train crew observed a tarp covering the boys' bodies on the tracks prior to the impact. The conductor even showed investigators where the tarp had landed after the impact. Nevertheless, the police denied the tarp's existence. Paramedics. The paramedics. Yeah, I believe well, that that, the, the paramedics picked up a tarp from the boys. I believe that's. That, they had it coming down the railroad anyway. They had. They had body bags. Right. Going, walking down through here, picking up different. You know. But separate from the body bag was was a tarp. Right. Right. Remember what color it was? I can't remember. Everything was kind of in a chaos. And, sure. You know, I really didn't pay that. That, that that thing much tension. Sure. I knew it was uh, some kind of a tarp. You yes, know, sir. it wasn't a bad body bag. Because they had it, you know, more or less folded. And close as I can remember, they laid it down right there. When we began hearing rumors about a tarp covering Kevin and Don on the tracks, we questioned Saline County law enforcement about it. Rick Elmendorf and Chuck Talent uh, sat here in my living room and told us that they were absolutely certain that that was an optical illusion that the train crew had seen, that uh, they had conducted tests on their clothing, which would have revealed fibers from a tarp impacted either on the clothing or the bodies themselves. We found out much later that that was a lie. Uh, they had never conducted tests on their clothing. And uh, my interpretation is, of that is that um, they had some reason to lie, uh, uh, perhaps were even involved themselves. And what would turn out to be the most ironic twist in this case? Deputy Prosecutor Richard Garrett and his friend Defense Attorney Dan Harmon approached Linda Ives and convinced her that they would do everything in their power to catch those responsible for the murder of their son. Harmon was subsequently appointed Special Prosecutor to head the grand jury probe. However, as his investigation advanced, potential witnesses began turning up dead. May, 1988. Keith Coney, who was believed to be with Kevin and Don that night, told friends and family members that law enforcement officials were responsible for the murders. Two days later, he was killed when his motorcycle crashed while he was being chased. According to some officers, his throat had previously been slashed and he was apparently fleeing his attackers when he lost control. However, this crucial information was left out of the final report. There was no autopsy or investigation. And I don't think it was an accident because he was fearing for his life, you know, a couple of months before. He said a couple of times that he knew people, that he was being watched and he was afraid. Mrs. Alexander says her son knew the two teenagers run over by the train, and she says he indicated to her he had been there when the boys had died, that he spotted two attackers. But he knew there was two there. I did try to get him to tell me who, and he, he was either afraid or didn't know. November, 1988. Keith McCaskill, who was allegedly at the tracks that night, turned over information he had about the boys' murders to Richard Garrett. Believing he had talked to the wrong people, McCaskill had made his own funeral arrangements, told family and friends goodbye, and within days was murdered himself, stabbed 113 times. His murder remains unsolved. On the night of uh, elections in 1988, uh, he took two pennies out of his pocket and threw them on the bar there at the wagon wheel and said, if Jim Steed loses this election, my life isn't worth two cents. And he was murdered that night. Harmon, Garrett, and members of the Arkansas police suddenly found themselves in the awkward position of having to try and convince the public that the deaths of these key witnesses coming at a crucial point in the investigations were merely a coincidence. I think that Mr. McCaskill was probably suffering from a lot of paranoia. And right now the indications are that nobody else was involved. Might there have been a reason though for his paranoia? I'm sure there was a reason for his paranoia. Uh, 
because he had talked to the police or to the prosecutor? I don't know that that would be the reason. What about uh, the murder? Is it connected at all with the uh, grand jury investigation? Not that we know of. McCaskill was a witness in the Bryant train deaths investigation. Although police haven't ascertained a motive for the murder, they say there's no connection. Would link uh, this investigation to the death of Don Henry or Kevin Ives. And I don't foresee anything in, in uh, the pursuance of the rest of this investigation that would be uh, anything that would uh, make me change my mind. Those believing in a massive cover-up by police and elected officials, which included the possible murder of witnesses, watched in horror as the death toll continued to climb. January 1989, Greg Collins, who failed to appear after being subpoenaed to testify before Kevin and Don's grand jury, was killed by a shotgun blast to the face. His murder remains unsolved. March 1989, Booney Bearden, a friend of both Coney and Collins, disappeared. An article of Bearden's clothing was found in the vicinity where an anonymous caller claimed his murder had taken place. His body was never recovered. April 1989, Jeff Rhodes was murdered after telling his family he knew too much about Kevin, Don, and McCaskill's murders. Rhodes had been shot in the head and his remains set on fire in a dump. July 1989, Richard Winters, another grand jury witness, was gunned down during a robbery, which apparently was staged to cover his murder. His case remains unsolved. June 1990, Jordan Kettleson, who was believed to be connected to the McCaskill murder, was killed by a shotgun blast to the head. There was no police investigation, and his body was cremated before an autopsy could be performed. June 1995, Mike Samples, another grand jury witness, was shot to death. Sources claim he had been involved in retrieving drugs dropped from airplanes. Authorities have denied any connection between these cases and the murders of Kevin and Don. The people whose testimony might have solved this case years ago have systematically been eliminated. There apparently was a great deal of fear that these people could implicate very powerful players. The eight-month-long grand jury investigation into Kevin and Don's murder came to an abrupt halt December 31, 1988. Last-minute legal maneuvering by Harmon, Garrett, and presiding judge John Cole prevented the jurors from revealing their findings in the final report. The men and women of the grand jury were sent home frustrated that they had not been allowed to do their job. The Saline County Special Grand Jury has now disbanded. Three hours ago, it delivered its final report on the deaths of two teenage boys. But the grand jury was not allowed to do what it wanted. I know that because you could not repeat in the report much of the testimony that you heard and evidence that you received, <laughs> that you are somewhat frustrated by it. And that's understandable. In the final analysis, I know that the grand jury hated to, at this point to give it up because I think the public needs to know about the uh, seriousness of the drug problem here in Saline County and maybe other surrounding counties.